Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to my little corner of the symposium. So glad you're here as part of the Global Patient and Caregiver Symposium for Ocular Melanoma. My name is Molly Vosino. I am a social worker on the oncology team at the Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center in Philadelphia at Jefferson Health, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And here to talk with you for this breakout session about caring for the caregiver. So if you are here and you're a caregiver, welcome. If you're here and you're a patient wanting to figure out how to better support your caregiver, extra bonus points and welcome to you as well. And we'll go ahead and jump in. So first, just a really warm and heartfelt thank you to all the caregivers out there. You all are truly the unsung heroes. And personally and professionally, I tip my hat, take a full bow. You are wonderful. And I'm just in awe of what caregivers do every single day. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being you and for the love and care and support you provide to your loved ones. So we're going to talk about a bunch of different realms today. Basically, I want to cover practical support, emotional support, tips and tricks for how to talk to your loved one and talk to each other about what's going on with your loved one's diagnosis and journey with OM, and to provide you some strategies for how to put yourself first. That may be a concept that's a little bit foreign to some of you, and hopefully we can help you figure out how to best care for yourself so you can best care for your loved ones. So first, in terms of practical support. So when you're caring for somebody, you know, this really can look different, whether your loved one needs a lot of hands-on support, whether your loved one is more independent, um, whether they're somewhere in between, this is going to look different. And in addition, based on where your loved one is in terms of their OM diagnosis and potential treatment journey, this is, this is going to look pretty different. So, um, you know, for example, if somebody is, you know, if your caregiver if your loved one that is, is just stepping into plaque radiation, if they are having some sort of surgery, if they're involved in a clinical trial that's bringing them back and forth quite a bit for doctor's appointments, there may be more practical needs that come up that would be helpful for you to think about and kind of outsource and think about who can you tap into in your network to help get those things done. So there are a lot of tools online to help with this. Um, a couple of sites I'm gonna bring your attention to. In terms of sort of day-to-day -day tasks, things like preparing meals, grocery shopping, um, cleaning the home, um, you know, if there are outstanding bills that you guys are struggling with, if there are um, supplies or tools or things that you're in need of and you're just not finding the time to get. It's a really great site called GiveInKind, GiveInKind.com. And here you can set up a free profile and set up a number of different opportunities to help organize the help that's available to you. Now I'll start by saying, you know, and reminding you that at some point in this process, when you shared what's going on with your loved ones, your friends, your family, I'm sure that there has been an outpouring of support, people saying, if there's anything I can do, or let me know if I can do anything for you. If I can do anything to help, please let me know. If you've heard this before, you may wonder, okay, well, that's great and they mean well, but do they really mean it? And how do I actually utilize that help? So one opportunity would be to set up a site on Given Kind. You can set up a number of different things. You can set up a wish list. You can set up a fundraising page. You can set up a care calendar where you can invite your friends and loved ones by email for them to log on, see what your needs are. Is it you need somebody to come over for two hours so that you can run out to the grocery store and keep your loved one company? Is it you're running really low on toilet paper, tissues, paper towels, and you just can't make it out to the store, or you're trying your best to um, you know, keep yourself quarantined for safety purposes during the pandemic? Is it you've got a ton of outstanding medical bills and you're not quite sure, you know, how you're going to scrape it together to pay those. 
there are opportunities on given kind for you to set up strategies for you to organize that help people can log in and provide support. It's really, really great. Similarly, but on a more pared down scale, Meal Train, which is wonderful, has been around a really long time, is a, another site that's similar that focuses mostly on setting up a meal calendar so that your loved ones can log on and sign up to bring over meals or to provide gift cards to restaurants or grocery stores or um, delivery services. So again, this is gonna be really helpful if and when you're in a situation of sort of a period of acute needs. If you are, if your loved one is preparing for a nucleation or some other type of surgery, if your loved one is going to be getting plaque radiation, if your loved one is going to be having a set number of infusion treatments or is embarking on a new treatment and it's going to take a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of activity away from the day-to-day -day needs that you're used to taking care of, meal train is great for that. People, I mean, we know food is love, right? People love to feed each other. This is something that makes people feel really good about doing for somebody else. It's a way they know is helpful and it's, it's heartwarming for people and it's really easy for people to do. So personally, I had a friend recently who had a baby and I brought over a meal to her and her family while they were taking care of their newborn and it just felt really good. So this is something that's awesome, easy, free to do. Similarly, but on a bit of a different scale, let's talk a little bit about information sharing. This may be something, especially if your loved one is newly diagnosed, you're kind of just stepping into this. You're going to find, or you may find, that the burden of sharing updates with your friends and family can get kind of overwhelming for a couple of reasons. Obviously, in the age of technology, there are a million ways for us to be in touch with each other, right? So there may be calls, texts, Facebook messages, emails, people wanting to check in and say, how are they doing? How are you doing? What's the latest? What's the update with their care? Because OM is such a rare diagnosis, it's not like other cancers in a lot of ways, and it has periods of time where there may be some uncertainty like other cancers but you know specifically with OM it's I find that it's a little bit harder to explain to people in a way that they understand and so the burden of sharing that information with three four five six people that are calling separately to find out what's going on it can feel kind of like a lot so two things that I'd recommend so there's a really awesome site called Caring Bridge, caringbridge.org. And essentially this is a free way for you to set up an information page where you can, again, invite friends and family by email or by text or some other virtual format. They can log in and read through an update that you post privately to that page. You can create, you know, achieve a similar outcome using a, a closed Facebook group as well. But this can be really nice if you have a large extended family, if you have a big network that you are, you know, hoping to keep apprised of what's going on, but are feeling a little bit bogged down by all the calls and, you know, the, the repetition of having to explain things over and over again. This is a really great way to organize for that. In addition, we've got the holidays coming up. By the time you watch this, we're gonna be a week before Thanksgiving. Obviously this year, the holidays are gonna look a little bit different with everything going on with the pandemic. So you may or may not be spending as much time in person with extended family. But regardless, you're probably gonna be hearing at least from more extended family than you do on any given other time of the year. So it's something to think about and something to prepare for that people are going to want to know what's going on. And at the very least, to just think about that ahead of time and think about how you want to present that information or how your loved one wants to present that information so that you're prepared and you don't necessarily have to fumble over your words or spend a ton of time updating people individually. So something to think about can take a little bit of that burden off your shoulders. 
Um, the last portion of this that I want to talk about just briefly because I mean, honestly, this whole this whole final subsection could be I could talk about this for hours. The burden of caregiving the gift and burden and joy. You can explain it in a lot of different ways because it has a lot of different facets to it. But if your loved one is somebody that is in a stage of their condition where they're needing more help, they're needing physical assistance, maybe they're needing practical assistance around the house, they can't be alone or you don't want to leave them alone in case something changes urgently. Um, you know, you want to start to think about uh, accessing the home health that's available through your loved one's insurance, um, supplemented potentially with um, some caregiving assistance that may not be covered by insurance. So when I talk about home health, I'm talking about um, home care, which can consist of nurses, RNs coming out to monitor vital signs at home. Um, this is still happening during the pandemic and there's a lot that these agencies are doing to keep you and themselves safe during this time nurses aides to help with bathing and dressing and you know the kind of hands-on things that you may need a little extra help with around the house um, and can be really a nice way for those who are maybe even further away from their care teams obviously with om i know this from supporting the melanoma team at my institution People come from all over to get care at Jefferson in, in Philadelphia. So I sometimes am helping people access resources really far away from us and closer to home. This can be a nice way to have eyes and ears on your loved one in the home when it feels like your care team is really, really far away. Now, if your loved one is needing a lot of supervision, a lot of kind of hands-on support for a larger chunk of time, you're going to want to look into what I mentioned here, private duty, which refers to hiring caregivers and nurses out of pocket outside of what insurance will cover. Um, so just know, and you know, again, we're not going to go too deep into this, but these are conversations to start having with your social worker from the oncology team, with your primary care doctor, with your oncology team, um, and to start having these conversations if you're feeling like there's a lot of needs going on here and it's a lot on you. Because the reality is being a good caregiver is, or being a caregiver in general is ideally not a one person job, but in so many cases, it becomes a one person job. So it's about figuring out what is available to you and how to tap into it so that you can be at your best to care for your loved one and get the best support for your loved one to thrive. So next on the list, DME, this stands for Durable Medical Equipment. Again, a conversation to have with your care team. If there are things, if you're finding that your loved one needs extra physical support getting around the house, needs extra, you know, maybe grab bars in the shower so that they can safely shower or bathe independently and to free up you as a caregiver to take care of other things while that's happening, these are things to start to think about. Um, and then again, enlisting friends and family for some, um, you know, caregiving assistance in the way of supervision and in the way of companionship. This doubles as an opportunity for you to get a bit of a break for yourself. So obviously we want to be paying close attention to who these friends and family are, how they're caring for themselves and their family during the pandemic for you to make a judgment call on whether this is something you feel comfortable with. Um, but something to think about that, you know, these are individuals that not only want to help, but in a lot of cases, they want to spend time with your loved one and they want to feel, you know, that they have a role, um, especially for some of these closer family members. Again, all of this is subject to whatever stage of the illness your loved one is in. Earlier on, some of these things may not be a concern at all, and that's really great. But know that as things change every step of the way, there is more support that can be added to help alleviate the burden on you as a caregiver. So that's, that's where we'll stand on this. Okay, we're gonna talk a little bit now about emotional support for you. This is super important. This is something I talk about all day, every day. It is so, 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 so important for you and your loved one, but you really too, to have some outlet for support, 
some kind of unbiased, non-judgmental outside perspective can be really, really helpful when trying to cope with everything that OM brings. So, you know, like I said, depending on the stage, this is going to look differently for everybody. There a lot of times is a really big portion of time where your loved one may be just on surveillance, waiting for scan results, thinking through what the future could hold, sort of beyond that initial stage of sort of acute treatment that often comes in the first year or so of being diagnosed. There's all this in between time and figuring out what does this mean? How do I talk about this? How do I feel? How do I anticipate the uncertainty of the future? So it's really important. This does not only affect the patient, but it really affects you as well, sometimes even more so. So there are a lot of opportunities to support you. And this is gonna depend on what works best for you. So when we're talking about peer support, you may have heard that there are a lot of organizations that do buddy matches for patients. This is true for caregivers as well. These are groups that will um, match you with another caregiver or patient that's going through something similar to your loved one to give you the opportunity to get some one-on-one -on -one peer support and talk through what it's like from somebody who's truly going through it. This can happen through organizations like Immerman's Angels, Patient True Talk, the Melanoma Research Foundation. You can also reach out to them directly and they'll match you with somebody. Um, and especially with OM, this is a more rare diagnosis. There aren't as many people out there who are dealing with this. And sometimes it can be difficult to find those individuals who are going through something similar. Now I will say, the OM online community is amazing, so strong, so present, and hopefully you found accessible. So when we're talking about getting some good emotional support, I think talking about those online opportunities are really important too. So in terms of groups, the Melanoma Research Foundation, together with my institution, Jefferson, um, host a virtual support group that happens once a month, the first Wednesday of the month. I actually facilitate that group. So if my face or my voice sound or look familiar, you may have seen me there and would love to see you at one of our groups in the future. This is open to both caregivers and patients and you can email ljohnston at melanoma.org to join that group. There are also ocular melanoma Facebook groups, a whole host of them that you may have found. A little bit of a disclaimer on some of those groups and in addition, what I've mentioned next, these, there's an online forum on the Melanoma Research Foundation's page. You know, these are wonderful. And there's a lot of information out there, sort of by virtue of the fact that this is a rare diagnosis, the online community has come together to really share a lot of information. But as with any online forum or online group, there's not always a trigger warning when there's going to be information on there that can be a little bit more distressing, a little bit more unpredictable. So just know that before you pop in on those groups that there may be some information that is, um, you know, more upsetting to read. And it's important to understand that not everything you read online is going to be applicable to your loved one's situation. So if you ever read anything online about OM, about somebody else's experience with a medication or with a trial or with um, a progression of their disease, it's really important to fact check that with your providers, with your ocular oncologist, with your medical oncologist, with your, um, with your primary doctor, uh, your loved one's primary doctor, that is. So it's really important to bring that information to a professional to figure out, okay, is this something that I should be worried about for my loved one or not? And to that point, we may get back here, I can't remember, but I want to make sure that I say it. With OM, because there are so many different components, there are so many different teams, there's a primary doctor, there's the ophthalmologist, there's the ocular oncologist, there's the medical oncologist, sometimes there's a radiation oncologist. And a lot of times they can be at different institutions, sometimes miles, states, countries away, right? So it's really, I find it really gets sometimes to be as much as you would think that having more people involved would make it more robust in terms of support. I find that sometimes these institutions don't speak as well, it don't communicate as well to each other. And so sometimes it can leave you feeling a little bit isolated. So 
again, moving in next into this idea of counseling. I feel like I preach about this all the time. The oncology social worker should be your go-to, not only for counseling, but for help in kind of bringing the teams together and rallying information and getting you the kind of informational support so that you can really move forward and best understand what to do for your loved one and how to conceptualize this as a caregiver. And back into the realm of emotional support, it's really, really, really important, again, as I said, to have an unbiased space an outlet for support that you can talk through what's going on for you, how this feels for you, concerns that you're having about your loved one. And in a lot of um, oncology centers, this is available for free through an oncology social worker, or as in the case of Jefferson, we have a supportive counselor on staff in addition to the oncology social workers. Another place to look for, um, for counseling is through employee assistance programs through your employer. So if you don't already know what those benefits are, go ahead and, um, and look, those, look at those through your human resources representative, through your human resources department. Find out what's available to you through your employer or through your spouse's employer. Here we go. So just a quick note about talking with your loved one about their diagnosis. This can sometimes feel a bit daunting for a caregiver to not know exactly what to say, how to talk about this, when to talk about this, when to not talk about this. You know, as I mentioned further down on this page, it's not all about OM. A lot of times it feels like that's all that there is to talk about or that's all that's going on. But the truth is, as we talked about before, there are gonna be large gaps of time where OM can take a back seat and there are opportunities to find a balance there. So it's important to be sensitive to yourself and to your loved one about when OM should be at the forefront and when OM should take a back seat so that you can enjoy life, right? Learn each other's triggers figure out where those sensitive points are that need to be taken into account more carefully. Don't shy away from difficult conversations or assume that they don't want to talk about difficult things because it's really important that you talk about the things that are in the shadows, bring them to the forefront so that they aren't as scary. Uncover those veils, make it so that you can talk about things that may be a bit more taboo so that you can really fully understand how to best be there for yourself and for your loved one. This is really, really important. You are first and foremost, their spouse, their parent, their sibling, their friend, their child, whatever that relationship was prior to you being in a role of caregiver, that is what you are first. It is so important to try and honor the needs of that relationship separate from your role as a caregiver because your identity as the spouse, the parent, the sibling, the friend matters so, so much to your well being and to their well being. You don't want the role as caregiver to take over on top of that relationship because the reason you're in the position of being a caregiver is because you mean so much to that person as that primary role. So figuring out how to find the balance there and not lose your needs as that original relationship is essential. This is something that you can work on in counseling with a, um, with a buddy, with an outside perspective that you can kind of bump things off of just try and remember you were that person first and it's really important that you recognize and honor those needs. And again, make sure you both have those unbiased outlets for support. So as we're wrapping up here, I want to take a moment and just talk about how you can prioritize your needs. You know, for some reason, it is the first thing that is easiest to lose track of that is the most important for you to keep yourself going. And that is your primary needs 
as well as your secondary needs. When I'm talking about primary needs, I'm talking about you getting enough sleep, you getting enough uh, full meals, drinking water, the things that keep you going day to day. Why is it that these are the first things that slip our minds when we're focusing our needs on somebody else? And yet without these things, we'd all be on the floor, right? So it's super important to put those things at the forefront. As you've heard it before, I literally just got off the phone with some with a caregiver and was saying this to them. You have to put your own oxygen mask on before you can put somebody else's on. You are no good to your loved one if you're not at your best. Let me say it again. You're no good. You're not as good to your loved one when you're not at your best. So do your best. Put those needs first. And then those secondary needs. I'm talking exercise, intimacy, joy, playfulness. These are all things that need to be fulfilled for you to feel at your best as well. And they should not be overlooked. So a simple exercise I want all of you to try and do. Do it today if you can. Take out a piece of paper, take out a notepad, open up a notes folder on your phone, on your computer, wherever you can record, and make a list. Make a list of small or large tasks or activities or things you can do that help you feel more grounded, more steady, more at peace, happy, things you can do to take a break. This can be as small as putting on a song that gives you joy, lighting a candle, going into the bathroom and having a cry, screaming into a pillow. This can be as large as going out to the gym, tackling a home improvement project, going through your clothes and putting aside a donation pile. Whatever it is that works for you, outside of the context of a large stressful event, make a list of those things and keep that list handy so you can come back to it when you need it. You can, if you're feeling overwhelmed, or even if you just know you have five minutes for yourself, take out that list and say, okay, what can I do? What can I do to help myself right now? This is hopefully gonna be really helpful in helping you not lose sight of your needs and what you need to thrive. Thank you so, so much for spending this little bit of time with me. Thank you so much for coming to the symposium. I'm so glad you're here. Please feel free to reach out to the moderators if you have any questions, and I hope I've been helpful here today. Thank you so much for all you do as a caregiver, and have a wonderful rest of your day.